Flair's plea tonight, don't let the chance of Irish peace slip away. Revealed how thousands die from infections picked up in hospitals. More trouble for Collymore as Leicester forced to fly home. And the verdict on Victoria Beckham's catwalk debut. From ITN, the ITV Nightly News with Dermot Murnahan. Good evening. The Prime Minister tonight appealed to everyone involved in the shaky Northern Ireland peace process not to give up. I can't believe he said that we're going to let this chance slip away. He'd had all the main players into Downing Street for talks. They ended with uncompromising statements by Sinn Féin and the Ulster Unionists, though Mr Blair said he was sure that no one really wanted to see the Good Friday Agreement fall. Michael Brunson reports. As the parties went their separate ways tonight, the scale of the mistrust and the size of the differences between Unionists and Republicans was all too clear to see. David Trimble had gone into Downing Street asking for clarity. Back outside, he said there was still no clear promise of IRA decommissioning. The ball is still firmly in their court. We want things to work, but we have done all that we can do, and we cannot do more than that. Just before that, Jerry Adams had said this was all the worst crisis so far. He and Martin McGuinness accused the British government of tearing up the Good Friday Agreement. At the moment, the Good Friday Agreement is lying in a waste paper bin. The British government need to get it out, put it back together again, and be serious about the process of conflict resolution in Ireland. But the two Prime Ministers said that all sides were still committed to a solution within that agreement. And the Prime Minister and I are uh, both convinced that there's no reasonable alternative, a one that's never been articulated to us uh, of, um, other than the full implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. We've had these setbacks before. I'm not saying this isn't serious, but we've had them before. And we've always managed to find from within ourselves the will and the determination and the means to put the process together again and move it forward. And we've come such a long way I simply cannot believe that we are going to let this chance slip away. No breakthroughs were expected today and most assuredly none came. But it was important that the parties could all still get together in Downing Street and talk. Michael Brunson, ITN Westminster. Startling findings on how unhealthy our hospitals can be will be published in a report from the public spending watchdog, the National Audit Office, tomorrow. It'll say that more than 100,000 people a year pick up infections in hospital and up to 5,000 die of them. Here's Andrew Simmons. This is the first report into the control of infection in hospitals throughout England and it may cause alarm. Hygiene, a priority in this London hospital, but some others stand accused of not doing enough to prevent bugs from spreading, with sometimes fatal results. And the cost of the health service is £1 billion pounds a year. The risks of infections have probably increased and it's a continuous battle between the infection control team, the procedures that are now becoming important for treating patients and keeping at bay increasingly resistant bacteria. Every year, more than 100,000 people pick up infections while in hospital, and each year, 5,000 patients die from them. And infections contracted in hospital are a factor in a further 15,000 deaths. The report highlights big differences in the level of importance put on infection control. Budgets range from £500 to a million pounds. In some areas, one infection control nurse is responsible for more than a thousand beds, whereas the recommended level is one nurse to 250 beds. The report says those inconsistencies must end with better funding in the right areas. It says infection could be immediately reduced by 15% using more efficient controls and stricter hygiene. Andrew Simmons, ITN. Greater Manchester Police said today they had enough evidence to charge Dr. Harold Shipman with another 23 murders, although the cases won't necessarily be taken to court. The Crown Prosecution Service still has to decide. Dr. Shipman is already serving life for 15 murders. The cost of petrol is on its way up again by as much as another 14 pence a gallon. This time it's not the Chancellor, but the producers who are putting the squeeze on, with the crude oil price at a nine-year high. Here's Ross Childs. Motorists in Britain already pay more for petrol than anywhere else in Europe. Tonight they're bracing themselves for a further sharp rise in the price at the pump. This latest rise is all down to record crude oil prices. 
Oil producers have cut production, causing prices to rocket as supplies dry up. That increase is expected to filter down to garage forecourts by the end of the week. Over the last year, petrol prices have soared. In January 1999, it cost 64 pence a litre, that's £2.90 a gallon. By August, it had jumped to 73 pence per litre, and by the beginning of this year, it had risen to 75 pence per litre. Petrol suppliers say prices could now rise by another 3 pence to 78 pence a litre, or to £3.54 a gallon. But analysts say that tax is the underlying reason behind high petrol prices. 80% of the price of petrol in the UK is tax. On that basis, the government takes a lion's share, and the oil companies get a relatively modest amount of the total. But obviously, as the price of oil goes up, the price of petrol must also rise in the UK. The government looks set to raise the fuel tax once again at next month's budget. So it seems inevitable that the beleaguered British motorist will end up paying more for petrol than ever before. Ross Childs, ITN, Central London. General Pinochet's lawyers have demanded an inquiry into how details of his confidential medical report came to be published in Spanish newspapers and on the internet today. It was leaked within hours of being given to Spain and three other countries seeking to extradite him. It says that the former dictator has extensive brain damage. The contest for the Republican nomination for the American presidency is hotting up ahead of the primary election in South Carolina this weekend. The two men slugging it out, Governor George Bush Jr. and Senator John McCain, were today making personality the issue. Kevin Dunn reports. Thank you very much and thank you for being here. God Propelled by his stunning victory in New Hampshire two weeks ago, Senator John McCain is campaigning hard in South Carolina ahead of Saturday's primary. He is hoping again to upset George W. Bush in the race for the Republican nomination. The two front runners are supposed to have stopped negative and personal attacks. Mr. McCain preferring to concentrate on his reputation as a Vietnam veteran. Though a television debate got personal after a Bush supporter questioned Mr. McCain's commitment to fellow veterans. Now, I don't know how, if you can understand this, George, but that really hurts. Yeah. That, that really hurts. Let you, me should, you, should, you should be ashamed. Yeah, let me speak you should be ashamed. No. No. But Mr. Bush complained at attacks on his integrity. You can disagree with me on issues, John, but do not question. Do not question my trustworthiness and do not compare me to Bill Clinton. And the latest polls show Mr. Bush still leading Senator McCain in the run-up to Saturday's crucial primary. But the unknown factor is how many votes Senator McCain will pick up from independent and even Democratic voters because it is that cross-party support which is making the Vietnam veteran the maverick of this year's presidential election. Kevin Dunn, ITN, Washington. Here two brothers, one of them only 12, were banned from the centre of their hometown today under one of the new antisocial behaviour orders. They were said to have caused harassment, alarm and distress to residents. Here's Neil Connery. The two brothers arrived for the hearing with their identities disguised. Magistrates at Western Supermare banned them from the town centre for two years after the two conducted a campaign of harassment involving 116 complaints by shopkeepers and residents. Over the last year, through throughout, throughout the summer season, it was an absolute nightmare. They were just running riot, all in and out of the shop, shoplifting, being very abusive to the members of the public, and it's just been an utter nightmare, really. The boys, aged 12 and 15, who can't be identified, are now the subject of antisocial behaviour orders. New laws now allow councils to take such action. The local MP has welcomed the ruling. I have met uh, the retailers concerned, many of them, and the concern has been expressed to me in my surgery. So clearly the magistrates had to take action, and I hope it will be effective action. The 12-year-old is now the youngest person in Britain to have such a ban imposed on him. Both boys have been given maps to show them where they're no longer allowed in Western Supermare. Neil Connery, ITN. Sport now, and Linford Christie has been banned from the Sydney Academy of Sport in Australia, where he's been coaching British Olympic hopefuls because of his positive test for Nandrolo. The former Olympic sprint champion is now looking for other training sites. The sport's international governing body said that as far as it was concerned, the only thing Christie couldn't do was compete pending his arbitration hearing. The former England striker Stan Collymore is in trouble again. He's accused of being at the centre of a drunken disturbance in a bar earlier today, which got Leicester, the club he joined less than a week ago, thrown out of their Spanish training camp. Tom Bradby has the full story. Tonight, the Leicester team should have been relaxing in Spain. Instead, they were returning home in disgrace. 
At about half past two, when the entertainment finished, Mr. Collymore decided to let off a fire extinguisher in that bar, which was uh, a very unpleasant experience for all of those that were there. Stan Collymore is no stranger to controversy. An incident with his then-girlfriend, Ulrika Johnson, in a bar in Paris was perhaps the most notorious moment, but he's long had a reputation for being a wayward talent. He only signed for Leicester last week, a move many saw as his last chance. God willing, that you know, things in the future will, be, will improve to the point that my professional career, I can look back and say, yeah, I had a really low spell, um, but came through it and, and, and was a better person for it. Many observers thought signing Collymore from Aston Villa was a gamble. Tonight his manager was not impressed. I'm the one that's brought them home because nowadays, I have to say, with the, just over the last week, the idea that players misbehaving is just actually not on. This hasn't been a good week for English football. The FA has had to discipline four clubs for brawling and Paul Gascoigne. And now, tomorrow at Leicester, Stan Collymore and his colleagues will face an angry management. Tom Bradby, ITN at the Football Association. To cricket now, and Graham Hick led England to a nail-biting win over his native Zimbabwe today in the first of their four one-day matches. With 20 runs needed off the last 19 balls, this straight six from Hick put England on course for victory. The second six from the Worcestershire batsman sealed a five-wicket win. Hick finished on 87 not out. Victoria Beckham, posh spice, made a surprise debut on the catwalk today in London Fashion Week. She models some revealing outfits by the designer Maria Gratchvogel, who's a friend of hers. Ben McCarthy saw how she did. This short stroll to the end of the catwalk and back was, according to Victoria Beckham, more nerve-wracking than performing live with the Spice Girls in front of tens of thousands of fans. But even so, the audience were clearly impressed by this non-singing role as Posh Spice modelled two outfits as a favour for her friend, the designer Maria Gratzvogel, during London Fashion Week. And it was a chance for the pop star who's been at the centre of fevered media speculation about her weight to show critics that she's not suffering from any eating disorder. And many were convinced that as well as being a natural model, the 25-year-old mother looks like she's in almost perfect shape. She looked very, very good, and she didn't look skinny at all, and her thighs looked um, nicely rounded, which I think will give you know, a lot of comfort to a lot of British women. By the end of the show, now accompanied by the designer, the Spice star was evidently enjoying the experience and perhaps even contemplating a change in career. Ben McCarthy, ITN. The headlines again. The Prime Minister appealed tonight to all the parties in Northern Ireland not to give up on the peace process. He said he couldn't believe the chance of peace was going to be allowed to slip away. A new report says that 5,000 people die each year from infections they pick up while in hospital and petrol prices are on their way up again. Tonight's financial figures and the FTSE 100 index bounced back to close 137 points up. BP Amico was among the big gainers on those rising oil prices. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones was more than 150 points lower and the pound ended the day almost a cent higher against the dollar. Now time for a look at tomorrow's papers. And the Daily Telegraph leads with the failure of today's talks to break the deadlock over the Northern Ireland peace process. It says Ulster is again looking into the abyss. It pictures the Labour MP and new mother, Julia Drown, who was told she couldn't take her son into all areas of the Commons. The Times reports that the government is now looking for 28 of the most serious offenders from the North Wales child abuse scandal. It shows Victoria Beckham on her catwalk debut. The Express has that hospital's infection story. It says many have covered up the fact that it kills thousands of patients each year. It also shows Victoria Beckham. The Daily Mail claims that the Chancellor's plans to make the internet cheaper to use has wiped more than £2 billion off BT shares. And the Mirror reports that Stan Collymore's football career is under threat after a drunken rampage in Spain. And that's all for tonight. The ITV Evening News is at 6.30 tomorrow and I'll be back with the ITV Nightly News at 11. Until then, goodbye.
Good evening. It's a cold night out there and it's been cold all day, but temperatures now are dipping well below freezing. There are a number of heavy showers still drifting down through the Irish Sea, through the Midlands, as far southeast as London. A dusting of snow possible, but most of the snow up over the high ground. In between, temperatures falling as low as minus two or minus three, especially where there's snow on the ground. So a chilly start tomorrow, but a bright one. Some welcome sunshine for most places. Any surviving wintry showers will tend to die away through the first part of the morning, but at the same time, cloud will thicken across western parts of Ireland. Outbreaks of rain arriving, turning to sleet or snow, particularly over the higher ground of Northern Ireland and as it hits western Scotland towards evening time. Further east, staying dry and reasonably bright, but it's going to be cold everywhere again. Temperatures really struggling across northern and eastern parts, no higher than three to five Celsius. Further south and west, eventually perhaps making up to seven or eight. And the winds won't be just as strong as they were today. That's it from me. Here's tomorrow's summary. Power, Jen. Power, whatever the weather. Good evening. Leicester City footballers have flown back home after being thrown out of their Spanish training camp. Eyewitnesses have described how Stan Collymore, who's been with the club less than a week, terrified guests at the exclusive holiday resort of La Manga. Collymore has denied the allegations. After the celebrations of reaching the Worthington Cup final, Leicester flew to the sports training centre of La Manga in Spain for a break before the big match. Apparently the celebrations became over-enthusiastic, with stories of players dancing on tables and chairs. The incident which prompted the management to ask them to leave involved the setting off of a fire extinguisher. The managing director of the complex claims that was the work of Stan Collymore. When the entertainment finished, uh, Mr Collymore decided to let off a fire extinguisher into the bar and if you've ever seen one of those go off they are very unpleasant uh, because the contents obviously are designed to put out a fire. But Stan Collymore has denied the allegations. In a statement Leicester City said it regrets any embarrassment or inconvenience caused to any guests and apologises unreservedly. The club says it's launching its own internal investigation and will reprimand anyone found to be in breach of club discipline. Leicester City manager Martin O'Neill had this to say. Just over the last week, the idea that players misbehaving is just actually not on. Now, I'm all on for players having, having a, a decent time and enjoying themselves, and perhaps maybe it might be no more than hijinks. But in this day and age now, when you know that you're under the microscope all the time, you've got to, I've got to say, you have a duty to, per, to, to behave in public. Some bad news for more than 700 workers at a Stoke-on-Trent pottery company. They face losing their jobs after the John Tams Group announced it's gone bust. The firm, which makes earthenware mugs and dinnerware, blames a strong pound, which has hit exports. A 40-year-old man has been arrested in connection with the murder of a doctor who died after swallowing sulfuric acid. He walked into a police station today, accompanied by a solicitor, and is now being held in custody. A 40-year-old man walked into this police station in the City of London today. He was arrested and has since been transferred to the West Midlands. It's in connection with the murder of Dr. Karenina Longay, who died 10 days ago after drinking sulfuric acid at her home in Sheldon in Birmingham. Only yesterday, her mother made an emotional appeal to her former lover, Andrew Gardner, to get in touch. He disappeared soon after calling an ambulance on the day Karenina was killed. Andrew, I'm appealing to you out of respect and love for me to come forward and to tell the police all you know about what happened on that Saturday so that we can lay Nina to rest in peace. Dr Longay, who was 27, was a senior house officer at Birmingham's Heartlands Hospital. Police say she had split up with her boyfriend after an 18-month relationship. A week later, she died at the house they'd shared together. A post-mortem examination confirmed her death was due to poisoning. A man is being questioned by detectives at an unnamed police station here in the West Midlands. The father of a six-week-old baby girl has been charged with her murder. Rebecca Brayford, who lived in the Norton area of Stoke-on-Trent, was admitted to North Staffordshire Hospital with serious head injuries. She died in the paediatric intensive care unit. 
A rugby player has appeared in court accused of assault and threats to kill. James Cockle was charged following an incident in Worcester Town Centre. The under-21 international joined Worcester Rugby Club for Moseley. His contract has now been terminated. The Education Secretary, David Blunkett, has been in Birmingham to set out plans for more on-the-job training for young people. He pledged an extra £30 million to pay for modern apprenticeships, including time spent in colleges. The luxury department store Selfridges has confirmed it's to open in Birmingham. The £40 million store will form part of the new bullring development. It will be built just behind St Martin's Church and is due to open in autumn 2003. It's another boost for Birmingham following news that Debenhams is also moving in. Cadbury Schweppes has reported an increase in profits. Pre-tax figures for 1999 stood at £686 million, up 9% on the previous year. The company also raised a billion pounds from the sale of drinks brands to Coca-Cola. And the Central News Midland Share Index enjoyed a welcome rise, up almost 17 points at 810.27. Football and Wolves recorded their biggest victory of the season tonight when they beat Tranmere 4-0 at Molyneux. Adi Akimbayi struck twice, the first just after half an hour. Lee Naylor scored the second with a free kick. In the second half, Darren Baisley made it 3-0 with an excellent individual goal. Adi Akinbayi then finished the game off two minutes from time to leave Wolves at just one point off the first division playoff place. Well that's it, we'll leave you with these pictures. Central Weather, sponsored by Stay Bright Windows and Conservatories. The clear choice in any weather. Hi, there is snow out there, not for all of us tonight, but uh, looking very festive in some parts. The snow is in an area of low pressure, currently tracking across northern England there. It's going to be through northern England and out through the wash the other side uh, between now and morning. It is dropping a sizable amount of snow on those parts. Now, it's the bottom edge of that system that's skimming the top of our region over the next few hours. The uh, heaviest falls right across the top, Shropshire, Staffordshire, Derbyshire, and across to the wash. Uh, drier skies further south. Now, this lot will clear away into the North Sea by morning, and once it's gone, it's going to be a decent day for all of us tomorrow, generally a dry day with sunshine. Temperatures are looking okay-ish tomorrow, just around average, but with a cold breeze on top it will feel parky. Rain tomorrow night, but the daytime looking good, and if you wrap up well, it will be very pleasant outside. Bye-bye. The Central 7-Day Weather Line, 09064 710 711.